So today we are chatting to Lindsay and Lexi Kite of Beauty Redefined. You have been a dream guest of mine because I've admired your work for a very long time and a silver lining of lockdown is that we are able to get together via Zoom. So this is new for the Train Happy podcast. So thank you so much for making time for me. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for making time for us. We're so excited to talk to you. Yeah, this is great. Thanks. And how are you guys getting on? Because I know you're not usually together. So um, where, where are you guys now for those listening? Yeah, so I normally live in New York City, which is kind of a scary place to be right now. Mm -hmm. So I came out west to Utah. Lexi lives in Salt Lake City. And I'm staying in her guest bedroom. <laughs> uh -huh. We haven't lived together since we were like 19. Yeah. And that was going to be like the end of us. <laughs> yeah, that almost broke us. <laughs> <laughs> but this is much better. Now we have a buffer. I have a wonderful husband and two babies. Well, I have a five-month-old baby and a... Now she's four. My mm -hmm. daughter just turned four. But they're a great buffer. They um, keep things they're light so and cute. happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're good. <laughs> Oh, lovely. I know, like, I love my sister, and if she is listening, we've we've got an age gap of, like, two and a half years to the day, and I love her dearly, but could never live with her ever again. Love her so uh -huh. much. Yep. We um, feel that. <laughs> this is a special time. Yeah, we gotta compromise now, and I'm grateful for Lexi for putting me up here. Happy to, happy to have you. So, I wanted to talk to you, if people aren't familiar with Beauty Redefined, what is Beauty Redefined? How did it come to be and what is the nature of Beauty Redefined's work? So Beauty Redefined is a nonprofit that we started, oh my gosh, we started it in 2009 at the culmination of our master's degrees, which we were co-authoring a thesis and a visual presentation. And that started as just a way that we were, we were studying body image and the way women were represented in media and um, the effects that that has on all of us. And so we started to put that into a visual presentation that we, it kind of spread through word of mouth mm -hmm. and people started asking us to present at their school district or um, at their community organization or whatever. And so that really spread and we've been doing that visual presentation, obviously greatly modified over yeah. the last 11 years, but we continue to do that to this day, um, teaching people how to recognize harmful messages about bodies and beauty in media, um, in our culture, in the ways people think and talk about bodies just in general. And then we help them to reject those messages in practical ways and to be able to move forward thinking of themselves as more than just a body. So we, um, at the end of our master's degrees, we immediately went into our PhDs for another four years, which really helped um, create a new way of thinking about body image for us, for our research that we've been sharing with the world all these years later. And it just all culminated in a book. Um, we just finished our first book, More Than a Body, that will come out in January that we are so excited about to talk about our work, um, particularly in body image resilience, which we'll talk to you about today. Oh, yes, please, because body image, was, there's so many terms for body image stuff right now. And I think we've had a previous podcast with a body image researcher called Nadia Craddock, and we kind of went through some of those terms. But I would love to hear your take on it as well, because we've got body image resilience, we've got body positivity, and we've got body neutrality or body acceptance. And so where does body resilience fit in on that maybe that scale and what are your takes on what those points are on the scale yeah so those are all kind of pinpoints in a timeline of how people have started thinking and rethinking about body image and so our work has always revolved around the basic general term where this all started positive body image so it's feeling positively toward your body overall just very generally and then over time um we and other people started to recognize that there was so much emphasis being placed on beauty in positive body image. It was all women need to feel beautiful. We need to make sure that beauty, this term, encompasses so many different body shapes and, uh, you know, um, types of people. And we recognized that self-objectification was playing a really huge role in even people's ideas of positive body image. So people were still focusing on feeling beautiful as opposed to feeling positively towards their bodies, what they can do, how they feel, all that stuff. 
Um, so from that evolved ideas of body neutrality and body acceptance. We continue to just call it positive body image, but push for a more accurate definition of it. Mm -hmm. The term, the, the phrase that we have been using for several years is that positive body image isn't just believing your body looks good. It's knowing your body is good regardless of how it looks. So that's where we're trying to redefine positive body image to make it more about how you feel, what you can do, get you back in touch with your own body, as opposed to looking at it from the outside and trying to convince yourself that it looks beautiful or that you feel beautiful. Yeah. So what Lindsay described that idea of feeling beautiful, embracing your flaws as beautiful, um, opening up a wider range of sizes and shapes to be beautiful, um, that's body positivity. That's how we would um, kind of define body positivity, um, which stemmed from fat acceptance and fat Act, fat activism, but has really become kind of a more commodified um, term that a lot of people use to sell products and services that are still relying on beauty and bodies as the main focus of a person's worth. So many years ago, when we came on the scene pioneering this idea of body neutrality, we didn't call it body neutrality, um, but very quickly people started referring to it as that. It started in 20... Like 15. 15 when we wrote that blog post. Yeah, so for a few years, on, um, especially on Instagram, where we were really, our work was becoming more popular, we had had this blog since 2009 where we were sharing our work, and it had been popular through the blog time. <laughs> and, and Facebook, we were huge and on Facebook. Facebook, yes, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. um, and then as everything started to be geared more toward Instagram and body positivity was really flourishing there, we were also in those circles. We were talking about what positive body image means and what it looks like and how to develop it. And a lot of other people were using that same term, positive body image and body positivity. And um, they were primarily showing images of other women's bodies or their own bodies to say, look, I feel beautiful. You should also feel beautiful. And we started to just recognize that there was kind of a big difference between how other people were formulating their ideas of body positivity and positive body image and what we were doing, um, trying to get people away from self-objectification, away from imagining how their bodies look and more mm -hmm. toward how they feel and what they can do. And so we made a blog post, I think it was in December 2015 or January 2016, mm -hmm. and it was it proved to be very controversial. I knew that it would make an impact because it was... Um, it was saying something that no one else was saying, though yeah. I think we and hopefully others were recognizing that there was a difference in how we were trying to promote positive body image and body positivity. And so um, I presented it as the two clashing camps of body positivity. And I would, we would both do that differently today. Yeah, we'd be less divisive. Yeah, less divisive about it. Um, and we would formulate it more as... This idea of um, of encouraging more women to feel that their bodies are beautiful and expanding definitions of beauty to include more people, that it's good, but mm -hmm. it's a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. It's a stepping stone to bigger and better things. And the bigger and better things are helping women understand that they're more than just beautiful and that their worth and their value comes and their body image and how they feel about themselves comes from so much more than whether or not they feel beautiful. So let's dig into that kind of mainstream body positivity, like the phrases we're using. So if we're thinking of like hashtag F your beauty standards and stuff like that, is, are those kind of terms um, and where we're like normalizing stretch marks and cellulite and, you know, acne and all these things, would you say that's still leaning towards kind of that self-objectification, that kind of viewing your body to to kind of be beautiful, flaws and all type thing versus what you're kind of getting to do is to, from my understanding is like body image resilience is like viewing the the stretch marks and the acne and the thing and saying those things don't define me and don't make me a bad person and actually I ha I'm still me no matter what is that where we're getting to 
Yeah, we would, we would say that body positivity and all that we're seeing in terms of normalizing and diversifying bodies is so good. Yeah. But if we stop there, we are missing so much of who we are. If we stop there and we just stop at beautifying the stretch marks and showing the cellulite and showing the belly rolls, all we're doing is still playing within the rules of that system that has always objectified and dehumanized us. It's a system that is built particularly on the backs of women by telling women and girls that our bodies are our primary source of power and value. And that's all we're ever going to get from them. Mm -hmm. It's telling us that once we feel beautiful and once we look beautiful to others, or we F our beauty standards to feel beautiful for ourselves, then what? Then we feel beautiful. Yeah. Our work tries to take that a step further where we recognize that this idea of feeling okay, like feeling normal is such a huge step in the right direction for so many people. Mm -hmm. So many people who, by all measures, are normal in our society, but grow up feeling disgusting and embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were like that. We are totally normal girls growing up and yeah. in a middle-class lifestyle. We're white. We've got all these privileges. Mm -hmm. And yet we felt abnormal and disgusting. And so for girls and women growing up and growing older today to see images that look a little more like them and women who are proud and unapologetic, that is without a doubt a good thing. Mm -hmm. But if we stay there and continue to just seek out other images of other women who are beautiful and constantly have to remind ourselves that, okay, okay, the rest of the world says that this is not hot, this is not sexy, but these other accounts say that they are, you know, it's a vicious cycle because the whole world is pushing back on that idea that your stretch marks are beautiful and that your acne is okay. And what we're saying is normalize those things. If you need to feel that they're beautiful, fine. Mm -hmm. Some people will tell you that they're not and some people will tell you that they are. But as long as we're relying on anyone's perception, including our own, of what looks good, of what looks acceptable, then we're going to fail. Because those standards are being moved out of our reach constantly. The whole world is conspiring against us to make sure that we don't feel good enough so that we will buy their products and their services. And we need to find a different system of value within ourselves yeah. to be able to know our own bodies from the inside without relying on how they appear from the outside, even through our own eyes. So what we do with body image resilience, which we haven't talked about with you yet, is something we we don't see anybody else doing. Um, not on like Instagram, not anywhere. Body image resilience is this thing that um, has been around in academic circles a bit, but during our dissertation research, um, we developed a theoretical model for how to be resilient in the face of self-objectification. Um, and that is this idea of body image resilience. It is the most powerful, game-changing idea that you can see your pain. You can see the objectification in this world. You can acknowledge all of the pain and shame you have experienced in your life, the big ways and the small ways, the big ways like sexual assault and abuse, like um, like harassment and all of those sorts of things that come at us from the outside, like disordered eating, um, like self-harm that so many of us experience illness injuries, illness addictions breakups like all these things that change your relationship to your own body we all go through them regardless of whether we feel beautiful or okay in our skin or not and yet we're forced to respond to them and we started to recognize that in the other theories that existed about objectification it was this vicious cycle of of staying in a rut. You are objectified by outside forces. You take that perspective on yourself. You think of your body as an object, an ornament, something to be looked at, used, consumed by other people. And that puts you back into the spiral of being objectified by others, of coping in ways that are not helpful, that will not make you feel any better. Mm -hmm. And there was no way out. Really, in all of the psychological literature, there was no way out of self-objectification. It just explained all the bad things we went through. And we recognized a gap there that needed to be filled. How do you get out of that rut? How do you get out of a comfort zone that is deeply uncomfortable for most women who are uncomfortable in our own bodies? And that's where this idea of body image resilience came from. Because in that cycle of feeling bad and being objectified, you can recognize that your comfort zone might be deeply uncomfortable. It might be just filled with self-objectification and body shame. You might even feel okay about how you look, but you're constantly fixating on how you look mm -hmm. and having to keep everything in place all day and, and documenting your photos and putting them online for more validation and all of that. This is a vicious cycle of self-objectification. I think people are feeling that 
chat maybe a bit more in because we're currently in lockdown we're currently staying at home and you know I've had quite a lot of discussion with people as you mentioned about using the way you view your body as almost as a coping mechanism and you know with the kind of the anxieties and the tension and the stress and fear that come with the current pandemic that is playing out in a lot of people's sense of how they view themselves and their their body image is worsening and you know that what are your thoughts on that in terms of how we've learned to use our body as a coping mechanism the way I view it as I kind of work this through like through the therapy I've done myself and through my own experience of like I kind of I I wrote something recently where I said my body is I through things like diet culture and self-objectification I've learned that my body is like the easiest punching bag it is the easiest thing that I can let out all my frustrations onto and when you know when shit hits the fan in other aspects of my life the first thing I start thinking is like oh I've gained weight and I you know I'm not good enough because that's default for me um Mm -hmm. And doesn't that make sense in a culture where all of the importance is placed on how women look? And so then all of our successes, all of our failures, whether it's in relationships, in school, in athletics or whatever, mm-hmm. are placed on how we look or or how our bodies might appear or how they're accepted by other people. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, it makes sense that we then blame ourselves in every, you know, especially during these times of anxiety. Our anxiety gets focused back toward our bodies because we feel like that's a place where we have control. Yeah. And we feel like that's a place where a lot of our guilt is located because almost every woman in the world feels out of control. Mm-hmm. Feels like she eats too much or she drinks too much or she doesn't exercise enough or she exercises too much. Like most women feel out of balance in their bodies. Mm-hmm. And so then we blame ourselves when we feel anxious and when we try to control that anxiety through our eating, um, our movement, our exercise. Yeah. All that. But I think, Tally, the point that you're getting at, which is such a good question, is right now so many of us are feeling that our comfort zones are deeply uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And this pandemic has given us an opportunity to have what we refer to as a disruption. And this Mm -hmm. can be an enabling disruption. It disrupts your body image and your relationship with your body so that you can see that the ways that you have coped by eating the same salad every day and by doing this workout every day and making sure you get this many steps in, when you can't do those things, you realize, man, your comfort zone inside your body, it was on the verge of being deeply uncomfortable all the time. And now we have to use new ways of coping. This is body image resilience to see that right now, as your comfort zone has been broken apart, as you've been thrown out of your comfort zone, you can rebuild better than ever by seeing your pain, seeing your shame and using it to be more. For Lindsay and I, we are so grateful for the body shame we experienced our entire lives because it opened our eyes our freshman year of college when we started learning about media literacy, the ability to read and understand and comprehend why media is created the way it is. Why do women all look the same? Why do we generally only see one body type across all forms of media? It all, once you realize that everything is profit driven, everything is driven to cause you to be insecure, to buy products and services, to feel abnormal. For Lindsay and I, we felt that in such a huge and powerful way because of the shame we'd felt our whole lives. We suddenly realized, oh my gosh, maybe that's not just part of what being a girl is and part of what it means to be a woman. That pain propelled us through 10 years of college that we never planned on doing, through writing massive dissertations and all the hard stuff that comes along with that, to creating careers and lives and missions to help other women get rid of that shame we'd always felt. And if we hadn't felt that shame, it would have been invisible to us. I think so many of us, once we can see our pain, we can realize that that very pain and shame is pushing us down a path we never would have chosen for ourselves, but is so much more powerful and so much more needed in the world to be able to serve and lead and be in all the ways we're called to do. And when women are stuck looking inside, we can't serve the world. We can only serve ourselves. And that is doing a huge disservice to, to everyone, I think. Yeah. Do, you, do you know, I really resonate that. Um, and I wrote this in my book. I wrote, um, I said, this book would never have existed five, six years ago because I didn't have the headspace for it. I 
was so inward looking and I was so consumed with what my body looked like and I was stuck massively in that kind of self-objectification cycle that you're kind of describing that I just didn't have the headspace to think freely. I didn't think about things. I didn't engage in politics. I didn't engage in current affairs. I didn't, you know, take, you know, I wasn't watching the news and really kind of taking note on how that affected my life and the people I cared about and and society as a whole. I wasn't aware of those things because I was so inward looking. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest things when people, when, and, you know, I think um, the phrase, the, I'm going to get the, mess the quote up but um the quote of um dieting is the one of the biggest forms of kind of distraction. most potent political sedatives yeah you got mm-hmm. it and yeah, um and I think it's not just dieting it's it's that constant obsession with your body um it's one of the things yes. that I think really holds women back for achieving their full potential as you've kind of said I think amen oh we've got so you know, we've got so much to give as women, as people, and you just want to remove that barrier for them. Because I think once that, once that's down, I mean, it's just unleashed. Um, and oh, I, yeah. and I say that from personal experience, like I don't feel like I've done more fulfilling work. I wrote a book that I, I mean, I went to drama school. I never thought I had a book within me ever. And I did <laughs> something that I, I've done something that I never thought I could achieve, um, because I've managed to break the cycle. Um, yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and it's it's so interesting. It's so interesting. So you but you did a TED Talk, um, and I think that was one of my kind of early introductions into your work, which is called Body Positivity or Body Obsession. And I think we've kind of, like, touched on a lot of the themes within that. Um, but I really loved the kind of... Um, discussion you also had in the TED talk about how self-objectification um, impacts our sport performance and fitness and obviously this being a fitness kind of podcast I would love to hear what the research says what your take is on that and um, yeah how we can achieve our full potential not just in life but you know when we're working out when we're um, you know working towards like our goals and in, in sports and things like that. Oh, yeah. The fitness side of things is super interesting. I know you found that in your research. I discovered that early on in my PhD research. I took a a turn to focus specifically on how physical health is defined and represented, both in academic and medical literature, as well as in um, popular media. And so I did a really deep dive into the ways it's defined and the ways it's so often purely defined by someone's weight or their body mass index. Yes. And what a huge disservice that does to people and to researchers in general. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the biggest things that we find is that both in the research uh, that exists more broadly and in our own personal research is that when you are defining your health and fitness based on your weight, your body mass index, your size, how you appear, then you're objectifying your own health and fitness. We're so used to doing that in our lives. We're, We're objectified by the outside world really pieced into parts that we learn to either hide or fix or, you know, just be preoccupied with or even flaunt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, But we do the same things with our fitness when our fitness, our own personal health becomes purely defined by how we look from the outside or how we are measured from the outside. That's objectifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is reducing us to something smaller than what we really are. And it's those external things like the progress pictures and, you know, I'm a personal trainer and, common practice for personal trainers in the UK I presume it's the same in the US is that you know you'll have a client come to you they step on the scales they do weights they take pictures for their kind of before and after I personally don't do that I've never done that but you know I am not I've kind of deviated from the norm and it's as you said we're constantly looking to those numbers those um that kind of data of what our body is like measured as as a way of kind of deciding whether we think we're fit or not. And I think one of the biggest things about intuitive fitness and kind of what Train Happy is about and what I'm all about is getting people to kind of decide how they feel and like how, you know, there's obviously other ways we can measure fitness, whether it's like through fitness testing, but really actually I, I think a lot of those things like stepping on the scales and taking measurements and taking pictures disconnect us from our own intuition and our understanding of, you know, how our body actually performs. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's what I mean by we're objectifying our own health and fitness mm -hmm. because we're, we're turning this very important thing, how you feel and how your body is functioning and what your body can actually do. That's such a big dynamic thing that mm -hmm. affects so many parts of our lives. And yet we reduce it to this little number and this number that is, um, it is said to define whether or not you're healthy and fit or whatever. And so, so many people in their fitness pursuits go directly toward reducing that number or getting their body to look a certain way. And it doesn't always improve their health and fitness in the process. Mm -hmm. In fact, it might even hurt them. Like when people are using laxatives and um, over-exercising, compulsively exercising, mm -hmm. when they're dehydrating themselves, when they're, you know, under eating or getting into the cycles of binging and purging and you know, restriction that leads to the same binging, then we're really doing ourselves a disservice even while we may be getting smaller in mm -hmm. certain cases. And so I love what you said about reconnecting with your own intuition. That's really our whole focus is helping people, not just through fitness, but in their full body image, how they feel about their bodies overall, to be able to reconnect with themselves, their own inside perspective on their bodies, rather than constantly taking on this outside objectified perspective. Yeah. One thing we found in our research in self-objectification is that most women and girls own um, experience is cut short and is constantly being distracted by feelings about how their body appears, whether they're alone or around other people. In terms of fitness, that means that when you are snapped into a state of self-objectification, you can't get into a flow state. So when you're running, you cannot get into that flow state that gives you that second wind that gives you those endorphins that tell you like, I'm amazing. This is, this feels so good. You know, that feeling you yeah. get, I get it in my dreams. I dream that I'm <laughs> running and running and running. Um, you can't get there. And how sad is that for yeah. girls and women who can never achieve a flow state because we constantly get snapped back into how we appear instead of living inside our own bodies. Yeah. Are my legs jiggling? Are my arms all blinked? You know, I was doing a dance yesterday. I, I, um, almost 30 and I love TikTok. I admit it. I love it. <laughs> and I've been doing loads of dancing because I love it. Um, it's, oh. I'm actually, it's, I, it hadn't been quite vigorous until yesterday when I did quite a vigorous routine and I'm really feeling, <laughs> really feeling it today. It reminds me of my, of how I felt after dance class at drama school. Yes. And, um, I did one move and I felt my, my arm was jiggling and I observed it because I was like, huh, that's really interesting. I would have felt, I wouldn't have done this. I would have changed my top. I would have not, yep. maybe not done, maybe not even done the dance, wouldn't have posted it online if I felt my arm was jiggling because, right. you yeah. know, I'd learned that is a, a wrong thing for, you know, the arm to do. And <laughs> I was able to observe that and think, um, yeah, it's jiggling. Doesn't matter. Yes. I'm, perform I'm performing the dance. It doesn't matter. Um, yes. The joy I feel and the fun I'm having far overrides the feeling of my jiggly arm. Like that. I love that so much. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're describing is one piece of the body image resilience process because mm -hmm. seeing your arm jiggle might be a disruption to mm -hmm. your body image. It might be something that kind of snaps you back into that self conscious state of mm -hmm. self objectification. And for a lot of women, and like you in the past, you would have stopped. You would have chosen to hide yourself or fix yourself mm -hmm. whether it's putting on a shirt um turning off tiktok whatever mm -hmm. or um trying to fix yourself like okay i'm gonna do arm weights the rest of this week and i'm going to you know work on a routine and decrease my eating go on a cleanse whatever these mm -hmm. are ways we try to fix our bodies to cope but if you do that hiding and fixing or even sinking deeper into shame like abusing drugs or alcohol or self-harm all of that keeps you in that bad cycle of self-objectification mm -hmm. but what you described is rising with resilience it's using your other ways to cope in healthy happy ways mm -hmm. that actually send you off the bottom of that the floor you know mm -hmm. we get sent down sinking into shame and clinging to our comfort zones but when you choose to use your own um your own awareness of your body image and all that you've been through to consciously choose to reject it then you have an opportunity to cope in healthier happier ways like continuing to dance yeah like posting that online for other people to see and normalize what freaking arms do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what arms do. And you know, I had a, obviously I've been sharing on social media for about seven years. So I've gone through the whole spectrum of my body image, my relationship with food and exercise. And we've been through it all. And um, I think one of the interesting things for me as well as maybe a couple of years ago, I was, I would have posted that video online and said, hey, I'm normalizing my arm jiggling. And I would have pointed it out. 
And exactly. something yeah. I've noticed is now that I don't point it out. I don't even want to acknowledge it because I, d- I think it should be irrelevant. Um, yes. Radio, that's exactly what we would tell you to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, and I think that's where, you know how you kind of said how we kind of like get to a point with normalizing bodies and then we need to go a step further. I think that's one of the ways in which particularly people who maybe share content like myself or just generally post on social media for fun. It's like, I think maybe rather than saying like, here are my tummy rolls, just be like, there are tummy rolls on the photo and you don't even have to point it out. Like it, yes. it could just be. And I think that's like another step in the right direction. Do you agree? Totally. totally. Because when you point out like, oh, I'm posting this with my thunder thighs, even though I hate them, mm-hmm. that's still stigmatizing thighs. And think of all of the people in your audience, even your friends, your little sisters, you know, even people older than you who look at your feed and they, they might have thighs that are larger than yours or more dimply than yours or mm-hmm. whatever. And when someone says, these are my thunder thighs, that is further stigmatizing and distancing that viewer mm-hmm. from their own thighs. They're thinking those negative thoughts. It puts other people into a state of self-objectification. So by normalizing it and just living our freaking lives, Mm -hmm. then we aren't stigmatizing anyone else. We aren't putting other people into a state of self-objectification. And we're just being who we are there's more than a body yeah Mm -hmm. because the trap can be like oh if you think that about yourself then what on earth do you think about me what on earth do you think about my body if if you know and I think that's where some of the um disconnect comes with obviously body positivity in its current form has kind of been mainstreamed into quite like a thin white able-bodied thing that's the face of it and I think for people Mm -hmm. who started as you mentioned from like the fat acceptance movement who originate in that space they kind of it, I think there's a frustration because they're kind of like, if you're able to normalize a certain clothes size, um, that kind of others me in a bigger clothes size. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I, think, I think that's where part of totally. that, that kind of divide is happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. The fat acceptance movements, it started in the 70s. It, all of this body positive stuff body positivity stuff definitely has its roots there but fat acceptance was so much more radical than what we see today like it was all about like reclaiming your space Mm -hmm. making literal space for people but also showing that we are not invisible fat people exist fat people can be healthy fat people can be happy and loved and all of those things Mm -hmm. but unfortunately when body positivity has gone so mainstream and so accepted by you know huge industries companies that really make bank off of it mm-hmm. while who knows if they even make some of those sizes that has happened so many times where a retailer will post um images of models that are larger than what they would normally use yet they don't even make clothing in those sizes like they special make it just for the models and don't sell it in their stores Ugh. happens all the time mm-hmm. you don't know what people's real motives are and so this mainstream kind of watering down of fat acceptance into body positivity has just made it so much more palatable for people who are still fat phobic who still have really negative ideas mm-hmm. about what fat means and and how fat people are, you know, less deserving of love and promotions and, and, and yeah, yeah help <laughs> all of it. Yeah. And how do you find that work on that piece on fat phobia um, in kind of woven through the body image discussion? Because I think for so many people, it is at the core. Would you agree? I think particularly yes. in the fitness yeah. space where I'm coming from, the fear is weight gain the fear is a bigger body because it kind of goes against everything that particularly in fitness that we're working towards we're working on leaner tighter smaller toned all these things are meant to be the opposite of a bigger body and so um I think you did a post recently actually and I sent it to someone in my dms because I think you said talking of weight gain it's like if that's part of your healing process like welcome home to your body I think I'm very much paraphrasing there um Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah can we just like talk about that piece for us yeah (laughs) yeah I mean fat phobia is it is um kind of woven through every part of culture you could ever imagine and it is a really difficult thing for people to understand and accept because it is terrifying to think about gaining weight It is terrifying for most people to think about living in a fat body. And that fat phobia is so intertwined with our ideas of health and our ideas of being lovable and successful because 
truly fat phobia is is systemic. It is in everything. Research shows that fat people have a harder time getting promotions and getting hired and any number of other things. Have a harder time finding romantic connections and partners that aren't fetishizing their bodies. Finding uh, a doctor who won't oh. just dismiss their concerns or their pains or anything yeah. by just saying, well, it's because you're overweight, you should lose some weight. Like it's a it's a real thing. So of course people can feel and we understand why fat phobia is such a real thing because it is hard to live in a fat body. And when you hear a lot of thinner women say that they feel fat or they're afraid of getting fat, they are often not realizing how much privilege they have. There are a lot of people in the world who can't fit into an airplane seat. They can't fit into an auditorium seat or a typical chair at a restaurant. Like there are actual access issues where people can't find clothing to fit their bodies. That is a real thing. But for the rest of us who are, who feel such fear of becoming fat that our whole lives are driven by it, we, we are a lot of times exacerbating the problem by talking about fat in these ways in which we fear it. Yeah, we're we're vilifying this size, you know, we're vilifying something that isn't it should not be vilified. It's not a moral issue in any way. There are so many reasons why someone might be larger than somebody else, and the sooner we recognize that fat does not mean that somebody is bad or wrong mm-hmm. or has made terrible choices or is less healthy than you, the sooner we can reconnect with our own bodies and stop being driven out of fear. Because mm-hmm. fear of fat is what is behind so much of disordered eating and abusive laxatives and prescription drugs and all of these things that women do to cope with their own shame. So we need to start normalizing and accepting a diversity of bodies. That yeah. really is going to be at the heart of the healing of all of us mm-hmm. is being able to see other bodies and not instantly make a judgment, a moral judgment or, you know, any other type of judgment about who what a person is and what they're worthy of and yeah, and Lindsay and I are on our own journeys trying to get away from our fear of being fat because our entire lives when we were little revolved around being less fat. (laughs) Like we grew up, we're like the most privileged you can imagine in terms of like, we're white girls with like small waists and big, bigger butts, you know, like we are exactly what you see in every uh, like body positive, like Instagram feed, but we're not going to show our bodies or be defined by them because there's a lot of privilege in them. And we want people to recognize that they're more than bodies like you're talking about, but still like so far into this journey as like people with PhDs and body image, we are still working so hard to get off the diet train, to get off the yo-yo dieting and recognizing that a diversity of bodies, including our own sizes and shapes are okay. And that we are still capable of being loved. I can speak for myself and my privilege of having like a wonderful husband. I am like the biggest I've ever been. I'm also the happiest I've ever been. I genuinely am. I am deeply happy in my relationship with my husband, in my relationship with myself. Every day I still fight feelings of, I get those little glimpses of what if I lost weight? You know, what would life be like if I, if I lost weight, if I changed my body in this way? But now they, they float past a lot easier. Now when I'm working out, I'm on the, I've been doing um, the treadmill for an hour a day, like on an incline and it's making me so happy and I'm not doing it to get a tighter butt or whatever, like to lose weight. I am genuinely doing it because those endorphins make me feel so good and we're stuck inside and yeah. <laughs> it has been really hard. And I've been truly craving like movement and being able to just move and get my heart rate up. Like the way it feels on the inside is everything you talk about in terms of intuitive fitness and movement. It makes me so happy. And a few years ago, I would have been working out to get skinnier mm-hmm. and I'm not now. And that tells you that the work that we're all doing works. Yeah. It's possible. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, so well, it's a step in the right direction because 
in order to get away from all of the fear and the shame that perpetuates all of the bad coping mechanisms and to get us toward the good ones, we have to be able to accept our bodies right now and as they could be in the future. Yeah. Because our weight is mm -hmm. out of our control for so many people. Like we try to take control through fitness behaviors and the ways we eat and all of that. But really when it comes down to it, any one of us could develop a chronic illness. We could be diagnosed with a serious disease. Mm -hmm. We could get injured. We could get pregnant. We could have a miscarriage. We could go through any type of of life scenario. We could eat more. We could not have access you to the same You could get depressed. Foods. You could, yeah, you could lose your job and be, you wouldn't have access to, you know, the same expensive fresh You get older, you your metabolism changes, right. you know? It's all mm -hmm. outside of our control. And so the, the sooner we can loosen our grip on these ideals of what it looks like to have a good body, an acceptable body, we will be free to be able to pursue meaningful fitness mm -hmm. and meaningful improvements to our body image that reconnect us with who we really are and what we're really capable of. And not just what we fear in this world yeah yeah I like that um Lexi I wanted to ask you about your experience you just you mentioned you have a like five month old baby so you've yeah recently been pregnant and you've had a baby and I'm just I think um kind of people listening maybe going through like a similar life stage and we mentioned like that body image disruptor has pregnancy been part of that um journey for you and how did that kind of did you feel like a lot you were putting a lot of your work, your body image resilience work to use whilst being pregnant? Was it kind of like a oh, weird yeah. experience? Yeah, I mean, so I've been pregnant twice. I have a four-year-old, so I've done this before. But I can testify that both times I've been pregnant and given birth and then postpartum, body image resilience has been an absolute game changer for me. Both times I used pregnancy as an enabling disruption, like uh, consciously. And the second time it was much easier. I didn't have to do it so consciously. I remember the first time when I was like, like halfway through my pregnancy at that point where like you're showing, but your stomach isn't like hard yet. Mm -hmm. So everything's just kind of jiggly. And I remember my clothes weren't fitting and I texted Lindsay and said, my pants don't fit. I'm freaking out. I'm having a body image freak out. And she immediately texted me back. I can't remember exactly what you said, but basically like our popular mantra we've had for years, my body is an instrument, not an ornament. And she like yelled that at me probably in all caps in the phone. And I thought, Oh my hell, she is right. It's true. Like my body is doing this miraculous thing that is a privilege that not all bodies get to do. It also sucks. Like it's, for me, it's not like this really beautiful, wonderful thing. It's like I'm sick and it's hard, but it was amazing to be able to reframe my thinking to my body as an instrument for me to grow this little baby that I now love more than words can describe. Um, I was able to, to work through every little little bit of my clothes don't fit Ooh. by doing things differently this time around in my pregnancy um I I avoid self-objectification with the clothing I wear so I wore um uh, like my uniform at going to work every day was um a stretchy maxi dress like a like a to my knees kind of um dress with like a a caftan over the top it was like the perfect thing to keep me from thinking about my body all day. Nothing's riding up and being pulled down. It just it kept me from self-objectifying. Um, and I was able to just like grow and change. And then afterward, I had a really painful pregnancy or a really painful birth and was injured for quite a while. Just had a really hard time recovering. Um, but being able to be on the sidelines of my life for a while, like not really being able to move, um, really gave me this new appreciation for being able to move my body. Mm. And at about the four month mark, suddenly like I'd been in physical therapy and the pain started to go away and I started moving and I would go out the first time I did, I went out with my daughter. Um, and this was a month ago, like we were in isolation, but I started feeling better and I went out to the playground with my daughter and I kicked that soccer ball and then she didn't want to play anymore. So I kept <laughs> kicking it across the field, running to go get it, kicking it again, running. And I felt like I did in my dreams where I'm running and I'm doing it. And it's not, it's not like winding me. I'm not like so out of breath. It happened like that. It was such a gift to be able to feel myself move. And my little daughter, Logan said, mom, you can run again. Yay. And I thought I can run again. And now I'm not going to take it for granted. So yeah. yeah. I think that's awesome. And I wondered, did you take bump photos? No. 
But I didn't. I'm just not a person that takes a lot of like body centric photos. The first time I did, but maybe, maybe I took, took like one. one each pregnancy or something. Yeah, because it's kind of fascinating to see mm. how huge your stomach gets. It's a shock, but no, because I don't like the after photo. I don't like when people post like, this was my nine month pregnant stomach and now this is my nine month postpartum stomach and look at how small my abs are back. No, I'm not going to do anything like that. My abs aren't <laughs> going to be back. <laughs> okay, interesting. Well, whilst we've mentioned it then, I think we should um, talk about before and after photos and fitness because yeah. I know that you have posted about this multiple times I think you post about it periodically yeah. on social media and the comments are always so interesting because it's <laughs> quite a divisive topic I think people feel really protective over um body transformations particularly and yeah. um like I know um I believe the famous model Kate Upton got involved in some comments before um, maybe did she maybe no, I, I don't think, know <laughs> I think maybe you didn't realize who you were replying to but I think I think maybe um, and but people were kind of saying, you know, people should be allowed to feel proud of themselves and for changing their bodies and, you know, making these big lifestyle changes. So where do you stand on before and after photos? And obviously this is happening so much within fitness. Um, we yeah. spoke about bump photos, but where do you stand on before and after photos? Well, we're opposed to them. <laughs> okay. This is not to judge anyone yeah. who has ever done mm -hmm. a before and after picture or who likes to look at them and feels inspired by them. This is no judgment. This is purely from a place of our own research and yeah. understanding of how they affect other people and how they affect the person who does the posting. And so, as you know, one thing that we are extremely concerned about is self-objectification. Because mm -hmm. when women are thinking of their bodies from the outside, then we are not fully living our lives we are not living up to our full potential and we are less happy. Mm -hmm. Like when you're self objectifying, you are less happy. You are less, um, you feel less positively toward the whole world and in including other women, especially. Mm -hmm. And so when people are posting photos of how their bodies look, they're only capturing a snapshot of how their bodies look in that moment. We know that those images can be manipulated and changed, you know, within five minutes, she could look completely different from a different totally. angle, different lighting, whatever. And so what we stress is that taking those photos kind of serves as a way that we self-objectify just in a more permanent form. When we self-objectify, we are imagining a picture of ourselves. You don't even have to be looking in the mirror to be self-objectifying. You're just imagining how you look. But when we make that more permanent when we take a photo of our bodies and call this our starting image or our before. Mm -hmm. And there's usually some judgment attached to it. Like, I don't look great here. I've got my leggings pulled down in a way that is really, you know, <laughs> unflattering for the way my belly looks right now or whatever. Mm -hmm. And... And so people call that their beginning picture. And then always the after picture is supposed to look like better, better. They're, they're supposedly just documenting their fitness in a lot of cases, but every single time that body just happens to look smaller, just happens to mm -hmm. um, have the clothing arranged in a more flattering position, just mm -hmm. happens to have better lighting and, you know, all of these things. It serves to distance us from our own actual fitness. There may have been incredible internal transformations going on in between those two pictures. Their cholesterol might have been reduced. Mm -hmm. Their blood sugar might be totally um, stabilized at this point. They might have, you know, decreased blood pressure. All of these things that are really important to our fitness. They might be able to run five miles now without stopping or getting winded or do a certain number of dance classes or swimming laps, whatever their goals were. But instead, when we reduce it down to these pictures, we're kind of forgetting about all of those things. We're breezing right past them and instead purely focusing on how bodies look. Yeah. And really, most people aren't satisfied at the end. Even if their after photo looks really awesome, those people don't say, all right, I'm good now. I look amazing just like I always thought. They say, okay, in five more pounds, I'm going to look even better. Mm -hmm. Or in three more months of of upholding the same routine, I'm finally going to feel more confident in my body. It is a losing battle. And from personal experience, for me, it wasn't a case. I got to a point and I was like, I was just terrified of losing it. I was terrified yeah. of there being any mm -hmm. changes. And the more I focused on my body representing the, 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 what I believe were the health and fitness changes I was making, the more yeah. I became interested in it. I actually grew up as a teen yeah. not that... I'd never been on a diet until I was like 
21. Not not properly. Wow. And I hadn't grown up in a household of dieters. I am in a very unusual position. But mm-hmm. um, I going into the performing world, obviously you're looking in a mirror all day. Um, yeah. And then magnify that by deciding you're going to get healthy, but you only equate healthy to getting smaller because that's what you learned on social media. Um, so for me, getting healthy was like, taking pictures and like just constantly checking my body and like is my bicep yeah. defined is this is my am I ab showing today um because that was very important to me um mm-hmm. and for me it's so interesting like the more I focus on changing the body my body the more I became insecure about it because previously having not been that bothered I mean I can't say I was like you know this body loving teen but I just wasn't it wasn't like my main my main focus um to actively focus on it, on it, it made it worse for me. It became so much worse. Yes. Um, it didn't improve mm-hmm. my, my smaller body. Yes, I received so much more external validation and the compliments and the, you know, the, wow, you look amazing. Because I did lose a, um, a lot of weight. But in my mind, the freak outs, if there were any fluctuations in my body, you know, if I basically eaten a meal, you know, mm-hmm. drunk some water, just... The, the internal monologue going on was just of, you know, constant fear that this could all change and this could all be taken away from me. Um, totally. And yeah, it's so interesting what you're saying. Like, I think when we get focused on the progress having to look a certain way in the mirror, it also is so interesting how that totally invalidates all the other progress you've made. It's like, it's the ultimate form of progress when actually we should be celebrating, as you always say, what our bodies can do and not what they look like and like let's celebrate the you know being able to do more press-ups or let's celebrate the ability to swim more laps I've been I had swimming lessons last year learning to swim for the first time I know you are both swimmers that was the best Mm yeah and it was like the improvement I when I finally clicked front crawl finally clicked and I've never I felt so proud and in my own fitness journey that's probably one of the most proud I've been and oh. nothing, it had nothing to do with what I look like. And once again, my body is much bigger than it's been. But totally, it didn't, exactly. that was irrelevant because I achieved something. And I think it's so frustrating when people are achieving so much great stuff and then we undermine it with a photo. Right. And the real problem is a lot of that fitness improvement will never show up in a photo. Yeah. There's just tons of exercise science research that shows there are marked health improvements in Mm -hmm. people who start a meaningful exercise routine, one that they enjoy and that they can consistently do. And yet it won't show up on their bodies. And so they feel like they're failures. Totally. And unfortunately, Mm -hmm. this is mostly true for women. Women feel like they're failures when they do everything right on an exercise regimen in research. And if they don't lose weight or don't lose the amount of weight they thought they should, and we've all been trained to think we should lose immense amounts of weight from exercise. 30 pounds in 30 days. Right. Oh, oh ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah. when they don't see those results, they feel like failures and then they quit. Totally. Yes. And this happens so much. This is undermining our health and fitness by not only objectifying it and keeping us fixated on how we appear, but also by pushing us to quit when it doesn't do the things we are taught it's going to do to our bodies. Mm -hmm. And what does that teach girls and women across the world about our self-confidence and self-efficacy in every area of our lives? That we're going to fail, that we shouldn't even try, Mm -hmm. that we should just sit on the sidelines of our lives. Like, my goodness, we need girls and women in the world, no matter how they show up. We just need them to show up. Yes. Yes, I feel like there's, there's... So many, um, so many things I think to like draw on there. So do you think there, or is, does the research show that we make different choices over how we exercise based on how we view it can impact our body? I believe this to be true from the kind of very, um, anecdotal, um, and my own kind of research into the community that, um, follow my work. But I wondered if you'd noticed that in the body image space as well. So research definitely shows that women who don't lose weight from exercise are more likely to quit and feel like failures and be discouraged by it or go to greater extremes that Mm. aren't always healthy for themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, And it also shows that um, women in particular who feel too fat to exercise to begin with won't even try. Mm -hmm. So they definitely wouldn't go to a gym. They wouldn't join any group fitness or outdoor fitness activities. Um, They would primarily remain more sedentary. 
um, or try to do fitness activities at home and feel discouraged in the process. Um, so that's the research that we're familiar with. I have a feeling you're going to say that people want to only do specific regimens that will like make their waist smaller and their butts bigger and like tone up every other part of their bodies. Yeah. Like punishing workouts, you know, yeah. like only running, like that is the only option for women who want to get smaller, yeah. you mm-hmm. know? Well, the first question in my book, the opening line is, you know, would you still, um, exercise if it had no impact on your weight or aesthetics and then I like to follow up that that. question as like what would you do and interestingly I get so many people saying um some people are like no I wouldn't because we're stuck in that mindset that exercise is only to change your body and nothing else there are no other benefits but the people that see would say like actually yes I would I started exercising because I wanted to change my body and I realized how fantastic it was for my mental health my well-being for so many other aspects that I stick with it and I think that's what I'm really passionate about is like catching people before they start there and like let's get people in because we know it's going to make them feel good from the off Mm -hmm. like it's not something they Mm -hmm. have to discover it's something that is an you know we understand that to be a benefit and as you said about um, women not participating in exercise if they feel they're too big, for me, that's where I try to use my platform because I hold an immense amount of privilege myself. Um, I'm trying to sh- showcase different people in different bodies doing different stuff. So people are like, oh, there's someone who looks like me who works out, who does this stuff. I could do it mm-hmm. too. Because um, yeah. I think that's so powerful um that representation is so important yeah me too I love seeing like women in movement on social media Mm. I think you do such a good job of that of just like that's what a lot of people say like but Instagram is so visually based like how can I show my progress if I want to show my progress or whatever the thing is and one of the things to do is to show what you value and that is your body in movement that's not like a perfectly posed this is me now but it's just moving it's just showing people you can have fun you can move you do such a good job of that I love also seeing like people doing yoga at different body sizes I think Mm -hmm. that is so powerful I think filling your social media feed with a lot of body diversity and movement diversity is so important and helpful I 100% 100% agree so um with kind of what we've mentioned about the desire for getting smaller do you think you can be distancing yourself from self-objectification, be working in, on bettering your body image and still be trying to lose weight. What are your thoughts on that? Those are pretty um, in conflict with each other, unfortunately, because so many people have been taught or have grown up viewing one specific number or one weight range as being ideal for them. But so much of the time, when you really look at the number, your goal weight that you're trying to get to, maybe it's a goal weight you were at in high school. Maybe you were, you know, engaging in disordered eating during that time. Maybe it's a number you heard someone else say, or you saw someone in social media or on TV say that they weighed this number. And so you feel like it's attainable for you. Unfortunately, that number holds so much power that it does keep us fixated on it. If your health and fitness journey is focused on losing weight, getting to a certain size, getting a body mass index in a certain range, then you are at a distance from your own health and fitness because you aren't able to fully focus on how you feel and what you can do if what you're really measuring is a certain number. So I would say most girls and women are probably still on some journey of trying to lose weight. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just so common. So we would never want to shame or blame anybody for feeling that because we still battle with feeling that to this day. Um, So I think that while they're at odds with each other, there is a world in which you can validate your your feelings of wanting to lose weight and dig deeper to what that means. What do you really want? Do you Mm -hmm. want love? And you feel like you can't get it until you lose weight. Do you want to be able to move better with your kids to get up off the ground with ease? Do you want to be able to play an intramural sport with your partner on the weekends? Think about what you really want and then actually set a goal that can get you there 
even if it has nothing to do with weight loss, and especially if it has nothing to do with weight loss. So a lot of times our our hopes and dreams about losing weight aren't actually about losing weight. They're about attaining something much deeper than that, that we think we can do once we lose weight. And the truth is lots of thin women don't have perfect relationships. They do not get the love they deserve. And you can't get that by having a thinner body or bigger boobs or a tighter butt or whatever. That's not love. That's objectification. You know, mm. if somebody's only with you for that, that's that's not love and that is not lasting. It will break you in the end. Um, a lot of people think like they use the, not the excuse, but they say, I want to get healthy for my kids. I want to be able to move and, you know, live easier. And that is a great goal. And it might not have anything to do with weight loss for you. That you should then move your body, set a goal to do this many dance classes per month or, you know, whatever the thing might be, this many laps in the swimming pool or this many dance parties with your kids, whatever the thing is, and then get there and don't measure your scale and do your best to wear clothing that you can wear if you lose a few pounds or gain a few pounds so that you're not constantly self-objectifying and body checking by what you're wearing. Mm. You can live outside of your goals of weight loss and you can attain the goals you want and they're not going to have anything to do with the number on the scale. Yeah, your goals are definitely going to look different if they're not going to be so easily simplified and boiled down to one specific number. Like, that's an easy thing to do. The harder thing to do is to dig deeper and figure mm -hmm. out what you really want. What do you want to experience? What do you want to be able to feel? How many flights of stairs do you want to be able to go up without being winded? Mm -hmm. Like, these are real measurable things that will improve your life and they will improve your health and fitness in the process in ways that reaching a certain number could never do totally. and will never guarantee. And I think, yeah, and I think it's, like, important to say as well, um, I always tell people that let's shift the focus from that weight loss, that num those numbers there might be changes. The scale might go up or down. We don't yeah, know what's going right. to happen. And we just, as, as we're kind of neutral about our body image, we need to be neutral about that as well. We need to kind of say mm -hmm. like, it's not that, um, particularly in the kind of non-diet space, it's not that, I think people get the... The, mis the confusion that we're kind of saying like weight loss is bad full stop no one's yeah. allowed to lose weight ever it's not that at all it's just saying that focusing on that you know doesn't serve you and your body your weight may fluctuate and change and that is absolutely okay that might might be a byproduct for some people but the more we focus on it the more it's detrimental to our overall well-being and it's like let's find that differentiation because I think amen you know we've got like you said like the progress and fitness our health everything is so intertwined with that number on the scale and let's remove that out of the the kind of um the equation and what you were saying about when we're wanting weight loss and actually wanting other things like love acceptance to be liked um to be needed I saw a really interesting post from she's called Molly B counseling on Instagram and she said um we're basically what if the thing that's potentially harming us whether that be our body image the way we view our bodies is that we're all striving to be happy and in that pursuit of happiness we might turn to um, like substance abuse or, um, you know, disordered eating or this intense focus on our body image and that we're all essentially just trying to be happy, but we just haven't had the tools to do that. Um, and that was like a bit of a yeah. light bulb for me. I was like, yes. And um, I'm a big advocate of therapy and I want to talk about it as much as possible because I want to normalize mm -hmm. it as much as possible. And, you know, I, I think this is where if I had, um, you know, a pot of gold, I would make sure that everyone got to see a therapist. Cause I think that's where you get to work on this stuff because a lot of the stuff that we're craving with wanting to change our body is that inner turmoil that we haven't quite dealt with or, you know, if we just change our body, that will fix actually the deeper feelings that we kind of touched on before. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think what you're getting at is so important because there is joy to be found in seeing your body as beautiful. If we're thinking in the realms of body positivity, there's joy to be found in experiencing your body as an instrument, not an ornament, um, our mantra, but the broader idea of body neutrality, that your body is, that it is good. It's instrumental. It's good for more than just how it appears. But there is an incredible amount of joy and purpose and empowerment to be found in our work in body image 
damage resilience in the ability to not only see your pain, but use it as a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block Mm -hmm. to use your pain as your power, as your message, as your platform, that pain you've experienced, even though you don't deserve it, even though you would never choose it for yourself, whatever you've experienced, whatever your inner turmoil is that you are dealing with, that can be the very thing that gives you your calling in life, that gives you your mission and your purpose, that allows you to hear people you wouldn't have heard before and seen people you wouldn't have seen, that allows you to serve and lead and have a voice in ways that you never would have planned. That's where happiness is found. Happiness is found in purpose, in resilience, in rising up in the face of all the pain that we are all inevitably going to experience. And that is what we're trying to shout from the rooftops. It's what we talk all about in our book. We we describe this idea of these this kind of like journey through body positivity to body neutrality to the ultimate goal of body image resilience. And we do that because we know how much joy and purpose and power people can find in their pain, but they can't find it until they acknowledge it, until they see it. And one of the most important pieces of this is that body image resilience isn't just like a status that you get to. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing process. You develop your own ability to experience body image resilience every time you go through something difficult that knocks you out of your comfort zone Mm -hmm. and forces you to respond. So this pain that Lexi's talking about that can point you toward your mission and your power and all of that, it's really just those hard things you go through that change the way you feel about your body that give you an opportunity to respond in a new way. So maybe all the times before you would have hidden or fixed or coped in really harmful ways this time you can respond in ways that actually serve you by using your body as an instrument and not an ornament by really engaging your brain to figure out what are my goals what am i looking for what's causing me this pain and how can i work around it therapy is one of those big ways Mm -hmm. that you can actually uncover what's at the heart of all of your pain and suffering because for so many of us we learned these ideas these core beliefs as children and one of those core beliefs for way too many of us is that fat is bad and that Mm -hmm. having a larger body is wrong and it will make you unhappy and unhealthy. Mm -hmm. We have to unlearn those core beliefs constantly by going through these hard things and choosing the path to body image resilience Mm -hmm. instead of just hiding and fixing and coping. So something I've always wanted to ask you both um, because this is something I have have my own inner conflict about and I'm interested in is stepping away from self-objectification, working on viewing yourself as more than a body, but um, wearing makeup, do, using fake tan, um, get, doing your hair a certain way. For me personally, I've kind of wrestled with that maybe for like the last 12 months, um, really trying to challenge myself in how I do I need makeup and being able to just be without it. Um, like I had a, like I had a wedding in September and it's really interesting. I was looking back through like a load of photos with my boyfriend the other night and just the evolution of myself was so interesting since we started dating like six years ago. It's been a whole, whole, the whole journey. And, uh-huh. um, it was interesting, this final wedding, I, I remember saying to myself, like, I'm not going to fake tan for this wedding. I had awful, um, tan lines on my back from where I'd been sunbathing. Cause it was like a, an, a, a wedding abroad and I said no I'm not gonna wear this is backless dress I'm not gonna tan because I do not need a tan to feel good about myself because I don't I do not want to rely on fake tan for my Mm -hmm. for my self-esteem and um I've kind of from the conclusions I've come to myself but I'm very interested to hear your thoughts the conclusion I've come to myself is I it's like I've I'm, I have permission to use these things, but I need to use them and not rely on them. So I can like use them. So I'm wearing makeup now, but um, I can. I don't feel like I'm a better person right now. I just feel like I'm the makeup version of my face, and me without makeup is also me and my face. And it's yeah. Once again, find that neutrality in that. And I think um, yes. you know, like my pale skin is my pale skin, and sometimes it's tanned. And those are like I'm allowed to tan if I want to, but you know, it's not because I think that's better. That just is. And that's where I'm trying to get to. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, we, we have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, it's important to acknowledge that none of us make our choices in a vacuum. Mm. We make our choices based on our whole lives of every message we've ever received about what it looks like to be a girl or a woman. So, you know, men are largely not asked to do the work that women are asked to do. We don't know many men that are self-conscious of their eyelashes, you know, that mm. think about their eyelashes every day. If they need to be longer, if they need makeup on them, you know. And the works, you can go all the way on down. It is important to acknowledge that every single inch of our bodies have been co-opted by industries that are profiting from us. Every inch of our skin, every inch. And we go through every part in our book. Yeah. (laughs) Ooh, that was a journey. Right. (laughs) It's not just like a natural female human way to be, to think that our skin needs to be darker for white women and lighter for dark Mm -hmm. women, you know? Mm -hmm. Like these are things that we've learned. And, but really the answer is just in the asking of the question. Mm -hmm. You wrestle with this whole idea of like, am I relying on this too much? Am I, um, am I self-objectifying by wearing makeup and all of these things? That is the answer. You are, when you're wrestling with that question, that shows that you have an awareness of all the pressures that are going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's, that is your solution is the taking of inventory Mm -hmm. of how much time and energy and, you know, mental and physical energy you put into the way your body appears And when we take inventory of it, that can give us an opportunity to like stop and think and figure out, am I using too much time, energy, money, mental focus for how I appear? Is, am I comfortable with it? Is it serving me? Are there things that I could cut out and still feel like myself? And are my choices, most importantly, are my choices based in shame? Yeah. Mm. Am I wearing this makeup because I am ashamed of how my face looks normally? Am I ashamed of how people will see me once they've always seen me with a tan or with makeup on Mm -hmm. or with my hair done a certain way? Am I afraid that they will like me less or will judge me or say mean things about me? All of these are based in fear and shame and really in self-objectification. Yeah. Lindsay and I have taken the opportunity during quarantine to stop wearing makeup. And that's a thing that like my husband would see me without makeup, you know, like waking up in the morning and like sometimes on weekends. But for the most part, like I'm usually wearing some makeup. And And I still covered my zits because my face is out of control right now. (laughs) I don't want you to stare right into my acne. (laughs) But honestly, it's like realizing that I did use a lot of things out of shame has helped me see by proving to myself when I remove them from my beauty work that I am still me, that Mm. I am still capable of being loved. I'm still happy. My daughters look at me the exact same way they always did. My husband does too. Like... I'm still me. So take the time. If somebody's listening to this during isolation, take some time to remove things from your routine that you are doing because you are motivated by shame and you will find joy and freedom on the other side of that. And then you can go back to it when you want. You can use beauty work as, you know, creativity by painting your nails or whatever it is you're doing, but find joy in it, not not shame. Try not to do those things out of shame. And what we really want people to hear in this answer is that there is no right or wrong way to do this. Yeah. We recognize all the pressures that people are under to look a certain way, Mm -hmm. to maintain relationships based on how they've appeared in the past, and all of these things. Um, Even as far as getting jobs and promotions and all of that, for so many people, hinges on the way they appear. Yeah. And there's nothing fair about that. That is the nature of the objectifying environment we live in. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't push back on those things and try to change them in our own personal lives, in our families and circles of influence, communities and beyond. But it does mean there is no right or wrong way to do this. Whatever choices you have made, are making in the future, none of those are morally wrong in any way. And we would never shame or blame or judge anyone for whatever choices they make, even if those choices extend far beyond the line that we draw for ourselves. Yeah. Like for us, yeah, we do wear makeup. On a normal day, we wear makeup. We both like shopping and, you know, finding clothes that we like and think look cute and all that kind of stuff. We We shave our legs occasionally. Yeah, we We tweeze our eyebrows. Get our nails done. All of these things. And we are not above any of that. We recognize that there's objectification and self-objectification and beauty pressure at the heart of every single choice we make. Mm -hmm. And we're not above it and we're not beyond that. 
because we all live in the same world mm-hmm. where there's these pressures that we just have to acknowledge. Yeah. But the cool thing about it is you get to make those choices for yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And nobody else gets to draw that line for you about what's too much and what's too little, what's based in shame and what's based in um, just enjoyment and celebration and personal preferences, you know? We do like to think of the collective, though. I like to think of the collective power of women um, when we give up just a little bit of maybe the money we spend on our beauty work, if we give up just a little bit of the time and energy and effort and shame we are putting into our lives every day, when we give it up, we have more opportunities. We have more money. Mm. We have more energy. We have more time. More time to do more and different things. And what does that look like collectively for the world when women have an extra hour per day, an extra few thousand dollars per year to do something different? What can we do? Where can we find greater power and purpose and happiness? And how much less pressure, how much pressure can we take off of the younger generations, Mm -hmm. the people that are growing up and growing older right now? And each other. Yeah, and each other. Like the more... The more women who decide to forego Botox Mm -hmm. and hair extensions and all over hair removal and, you know, all of these things that the pressure is increasing as we age, especially Mm -hmm. if more women start to forego those things, then it'll be normal to have lines on our faces again, you know, just like it was 20 years ago. Yeah. And don't we all want that? Like, don't we all want to just be able to be normal and survive in this world without having the pressure of getting injections in our faces every six weeks? And it's just, it's a lot that we women have to go through in order to survive in this world. So we recommend take inventory, push back in all the ways that you possibly can. Mm -hmm. If you can feasibly avoid getting cosmetic surgery, um, having all these procedures done to change the way you look, spending your time, energy, and money in all of these ways... Do it. Do it. Try it. See if you can survive, you know? Mm. See if you will still be able to be happy, to be loved, to have success in your career. All these things we fear losing and missing out on. Yeah. I can testify that you can. Me too. I find it really interesting. Like I said, I mentioned being on TikTok um, with seeing where kind of like 17 year olds heads are at and seeing how they view their bodies. And I'm really saddened by what I see. Um, I was kind of hoping that maybe there would be a bit more of a pushback against stuff. And there there certainly are people on there trying to, as we spoke about, like normalizing bodies and all that kind of stuff. But they're a very small minority. And a lot of people are wishing they look like celebrities, wishing, you know, comparing their bodies. One of the, I saw one of the biggest TikTok stars at the moment. I think she's got nearly like 30 million followers, um, tweeted that there had been videos made you know, commenting on her body and, you know, that she may have gained a bit of weight. Um, And I just, my heart broke. I just thought the pressure these kids are under, particularly those who have like, you know, got this, these audiences following them. um, It feels almost greater than ever. And I wondered what advice you had for parents listening and, you know, how to navigate that. What, how can we protect those younger girls just young people in general how can we protect young people um and help them break the cycle i think the first thing we need to do is to be super straightforward and honest with young people starting when they're really young like start with five-year-olds and tell them that these advertisements that you're seeing in between your youtube videos with all of the you know sexy dolls and like makeup kits and beautiful all the stars that look a certain way be so straightforward and say all of these girls look the, su- the same way, don't you think? Like, all the princess ideals you see, they look this one way. But people don't really look like that in real life. And all mm. of the people that you love in real life, they might have different body sizes. And their hair and faces and skin tones might be totally different than that. And that's because these media makers want you to feel bad about how you appear. They want you to think that beauty only looks one way. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't. When you can get just real and raw with kids from a young age and include teenagers in that and say... You know, everyone wants you to be skinny. Everyone wants you to be as sexy as you possibly can. And, you know, and that sexy looks these certain ways. This has been going on since the dawn of time. And Mm. your generation looks at sexy this one way. And these ideals might look this one way. 
but I want you to know that you don't need to live up to those ideals. I want you to look around and see the people in real life who are healthy and happy in positive relationships, in successful careers, who are leading organizations and governments and whatever, who look a huge variety of different ways and see what the real possibilities are. Yeah. Don't get stuck in seeing your body as a, an ornament or something for other people's use and enjoyment and experience. Instead, find your own joy, your own power through reconnecting with your own body, regardless of how it looks. You'll be able to find all the power in the world you need to be able to live a good life and be happy and successful without just conforming to all of these ideals that the whole world has has trained you from the time you're two years old to believe yeah i i think that even as we're steeped in all of this body image stuff we feel a lot of hope for not just our generation it seems like there's a wave of women right around our age that are ready to rebel Mm. against these oppressive systems you know you just feel it our eyes are opened we can never shut them again you know and we're the ones that are having the babies and raising the babies hopefully differently once we heal our own body image but we do feel a lot of hope for this younger generation that that I think wants to rebel against some of these old school oppressive ideals. I think there is hope that they can, as they're creating their own content, that they can find some freedom in breaking free. You know, there's mm-hmm. people like Billie Eilish out there that are, you know, breaking the I'm norm obsessed with love. her. I totally honestly right. think she's just amazing. Um, totally. Yes, she and and I think people and seeing like the discourse around her like observing the teens on TikTok talking yeah. about Billie Eilish. I think it's really powerful how they really respect the kind of statement she's made by yes. deliberately choosing not to show her body, really. Um, mm-hmm. Except she did recently in her show, didn't she? And she wrote a really cool statement about it, like, I'm yeah, damned if I do. Awesome. Basically, like, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. Um, yep. And ultimately, I'm going to make the choice for myself. And I think that is yep. really cool. Me too. Love that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of hope to be had. I, it will take our generation healing our body image. Mm-hmm. It's it's the only way. If we if we rely on these fat phobic ideas that we don't want our daughters to be bullied, so we want to get them on diets young, and then they fight their body weight their entire oh. lives, then we are just setting up another generation to be as oppressed as we are, if not more. Mm-hmm. We have work to do. Yeah, we do. We do. And let's end it there because I think we've got a lot to digest and just take on board. And I just want to thank you so much for taking the time today because I thoroughly enjoyed, yeah, uh, picking your brains on all things body image and body image resilience. And I know I've taken a lot of weight. So thank you so much. When's the book out? When can we, is the US release date the same date as a UK release date? Do you know? I'm not sure about the UK release date. It will be released in the US at the beginning of January 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they're still figuring out the international release. Yeah, but pre-sale will be a few months before that. And we are pumped and nervous. It's scary to put out a book with some of our work that pushes back against everything Yeah, you know else. how it feels. It's all scary. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> kind it's of terrifying. And then I kind of, like, for a long time, I didn't even look in the book because I was just like... Ah, I know what I said, and I just got uh-huh. it out there. And I know. You can read it, and we can talk about it. But... Take it or leave it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's it's also really exciting, and I think, like we kind of spoke about before we started recording, it's so exciting when people actually start to read it and internalise it, and I think if you have read Train Happy, you're listening, I really believe this book will be the next step in that kind of body image work that is so needed in... in um, in relation to our work on fitness and bodies and how we engage with exercise. So just want to say a big thank you for coming on today. Where can people find you? We, our website is beautyredefined.org. Find us on Instagram. That's where our highest engagement is right now at beauty underscore redefined on Facebook at beauty redefined Twitter at take back beauty. Thank you so much for having us on. It was so great to talk to you. You're wonderful. Oh, yeah. So lovely to talk to you and I wish you all the best for the rest of lockdown. Oh, thank you, you too. too. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.